Welcome to lecture 19 of ECE 4305, Software Defined Radio Systems and Analysis. In this lecture, we'll be looking at some practical aspects of using electromagnetic spectrum for wireless communications. We'll look at spectrum measurement and characterization techniques. We'll look at how to access spectrum. And then finally, we'll look at ways of sensing spectrum in order to understand and to identify any other signals that are operating within the same spectral vicinity. From a non-technical perspective, we've got to kind of understand how electromagnetic spectrum works. And, and what I mean to say is, um, what are sort of the legal and economic and political aspects that are associated with this natural resource? Most people don't think of electromagnetic spectrum as a natural resource, but in fact it is. It's, it has the same sort of um, economic drivers as things like water and oil and timber and gold. Electromagnetic spectrum um, is extensively used in today's information age in order to facilitate financial transaction, educational activities, national offense, and, and a variety of other sort of applications. And as a result, um, given sort of the plethora of different types of wireless applications that exist, um, there is uh, a definite possibility of potential conflict and interference between these different applications. So as a result, uh, we have uh, national regulators because uh, whenever you're dealing with a natural resource, it usually falls under the uh, responsibility of a federal government. Um, so in the United States, uh, the FCC and the NTIA are responsible for regulating and, and managing and, and sort of making licenses available um, for electromagnetic spectrum, um, as well as enforcement in case there are any violations. And so uh, these uh, regulatory bodies usually come up with uh, rules and mandates and regulations um, that, that all all other sort of like, you know, wireless applications need to abide by. Uh, otherwise, if they're found in, um, 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 uh, found guilty of um, sort of um, interfering with other signals and such, they may receive cease and desist orders or some sort of legal action against them. So uh, as a result, spectrum regulations are necessary, especially in today's day and age when we have uh, so many wireless appliances out there. And so spectrum regulations can dictate things like allowable transmit power levels per wireless device uh, within a specific region and defines frequency masks, like how much can your out of band emissions be emanating uh, from outside your band of operation. And even things like decision thresholds, like what, what level, how sensitive must our uh, radios be in order to say uh, with, with some sort of um, definite, uh, with some sort of definite, um, um, uh, some sort of definite um, uh, decision that in fact that spectrum is occupied or is not occupied by another wireless signal. So in order to understand how spectrum works and, and how it operates, um, it's, it's actually interesting because I, it's, it's a natural resource but we can't see it per se. Um, and, and it's actually multidimensional. So it's not like water where it's a tangible quantity or gold or oil or, or, or um, timber or lumber for uh, building materials and such or paper. Um, electromagnetic spectrum, although we can't touch it or taste it or smell it or see it, um, it's out there and, and we use it extensively. And it's also multidimensional as I'm gonna show. And, and, and it's described by something that we call the electrospace. So what is this mysterious electrospace? Ooh. Well, the electrospace essentially is how we represent a signal in multiple dimensions. And what I mean by dimensions, it sounds fancy, but it's really not. Like for instance, um, there is something like uh, the dimension of time. Uh, for instance, if two people are having a conversation, one person waits for the other person to finish talking before they start. So that's a way where um, these two speakers sort of occupy um, a, a duration of time where one talks and one does not, and then one, when one, that one person stops talking, the other one commences their conversation. So as a result, that's how they share a time aspect. Now in the frequency domain, um, imagine if these two people 
both talk at the same time, but they speak at different frequencies. So in time, they're overlapping, but in the frequency domain, they're still separate from each other. Now, for instance, suppose I talk right now, as I am doing, and then five miles away, someone else is talking at this exact same time. We're not interfering with each other. We're using the same, let's say we're using the same frequency and we're using the same time instant, but we're far enough apart that we don't hear each other. So these are just some of the many dimensions that can go into the electrospace. And it sort of really represents how uh, signals can be represented in time, frequency, and space, where each signal essentially gets its own multi-dimensional block. And we have other dimensions, but for me, it's a little bit draw, difficult to draw something in four or five or six dimensions. So three it is. So this could be signal, let's say number one. And then um, let's say on the exact same frequency, but a uh, different time and, um, and same space, we have another signal. And then let's say in another space, but the same frequency and the same time, we have yet another signal that's operating. Right? So what happens is these signals and all these transmissions and such are occurring in essentially, at least in one of these dimensions, some sort of non-overlapping block. And, and so as a result, we, we get this um, um, uh, electrospace model where every one of these signals um, as long as it's not interfering with anyone else, can be one of in one of these respective blocks, and and these are just a few of the many dimensions that the electrospace can consist of. So, in order to access electromagnetic spectrum, um, and to ensure that we don't interfere with anyone else, okay, so so we could have like a centralized controller that says. Um, you know, that monitors all spectrum and everyone's communications and says, ah, this frequency band here is available. Um, I'm going to allocate it to this entity here so they can transmit to that receiver over there. Um, that, that works in some cases, especially in, in uh, very, very centralized uh, networks such as cellular networks and the like. But there are other wireless networks that don't have that uh, that opportunity to have some sort of centralized control with uh, extensive knowledge of the um, uh, wireless environment around it. So as a result, it might be necessary, uh, especially in contention-based networks, those networks that sort of have to sort of look before you leap and jump into a, spe a portion of spectrum in order to transmit across it, um, there needs to be um, uh, some sort of what they call spectrum sensing or identify whether the uh, spectrum that you want to transmit across is actually available or not. And that's somewhat more difficult than it sounds because what happens is you don't know who could be there. Um, is the noise interfering with the measurements that you're taking so it actually masks or partially hides uh, uh, other signals that could be in that spectrum that are doing just fine. There's also the hidden node problem that we talked about earlier in this course where we, um, m there might be a receiving device that does not have a transmitter or any way of notifying anybody about being interfered with. So if you're, jam you're you might be unintentionally jamming that individual. So. So what we need to do is we need to devise these techniques in order to, to look through the noisy measurements that we gather across a frequency band to say, ah, there is a signal present, or no, there's no signal present. And there are three that are commonly used. There's match filtering. It's great in the sense that it's SNR net maximizing. It's an optimal approach, but uh, the problem is you're, you have to know almost exactly what is what are the receiver and transmitter characteristics um, of the of the uh, equipment, the wireless equipment that are producing the potential signals that you're trying to look out for. So there's a lot of a priori knowledge that you must have in order to pull off this type of spectrum sensing. There's energy detection, which is simply a litmus test. Is there more energy than normal in this band or not? It's good because what happens is it's very simple. All you have to do is take the magnitude squared of the frequency response of your of your um, of the spectrum that you're looking at, and then take the average and say, is it higher than a threshold or not? So it's really a binary decision. But these techniques usually have um, uh, uh, a non-negligible probability of false alarm and misdetection. So there is a third technique called cyclostationary detectors 
um, which uses the statistical properties of the measurements in order to see if there's any sort of correlated patterns. So theoretically, it's really nice because you can look underneath the noise floor and find sort of um, uh, the signals under, uh, within that, embedded in that noise. But the problem is those types of receivers are rather complex to implement. Okay. So once we can sense uh, the spectrum and we, we have these spectrum sensing techniques, um, we can employ them in a number of applications. And, and um, until about a few years ago, um, most folks have looked at spectrum as sort of like, um, um, uh, in a conventional sense, uh, kind of like a command and control type of scenario. It's like uh, essentially license, static licenses are allocated to various applications and entities for their exclusive usage and no one else is allowed to take advantage or utilize unused portions of spectrum during that time and that in those frequency ranges. However, as measurement studies extends of numerous measurement studies have shown, um, in fact, a lot of electromagnetic spectrum is underutilized, heavily underutilized. In some places, like the city of Chicago, um, th there have been studies that show that at, at any given time, only 15% of that spectrum is actually used. So uh, a lot of folks have, uh, have recently uh, been working on this alternative approach called dynamic spectrum access, or DSA. And it's a way of opportunistically seeking out unused spectrum for your own transmission but you you definitely make sure that if there is an incumbent legacy transmission that's operating in the vicinity, you do not interfere with that license holding transmission whatsoever. So on the one hand, this alleviates the spectrum scarcity problem that's currently faced by this and several other nations around the world. But at the same time, you preserve the legacy rights, which is quite important since a lot of these folks um, and, and companies and organizations have spent quite a bit of financial resources and uh, uh, quite a bit of time building up telecommunications infrastructure to, to optimize performance in those frequency bands. So you've really got to respect those incumbents, but at the same time, see if you can maximize the efficiency of that spectrum by using it opportunistically. So I'll, I'll, uh, right now I'll describe uh, graphically what I mean by dynamic spectrum access. So dynamic spectrum access works as follows. So we have in the frequency domain, suppose this is license spectrum. Okay. And that's by some sort of regulatory agency saying, uh, blah, 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 application by blah, 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 service provider is allowed to occupy this spectrum under these constraints and such. And so, you have your whatever app wireless application supporting these wireless links. Let's say we have one more over here. Okay, so this guy, uh, the nomenclature, this license transmission, we refer to as a primary user, PU. That's PU number one, PU number two, and PU number three. Now, um, there are probably going to be some spectral masks and that's fine. So suppose we spectral masks are something like this. And that again is by the national, uh, by the national regulator for spectrum. Okay. And then same thing here. So we got our spectral masks. And then what ends up happening is we have our signal transmitting in that frequency. So, so let's say we have an unlicensed signal that we design not to interfere, not to fall into those spectral masks and, and start interfering with those other transmissions, the licensed transmissions, the PUs. So here's our signal. Okay. And we call this unlicensed signal that's opportunistically seeking out unused spectrum a secondary user. So that's SU number one. Let's say we have another guy and he just looks like a triangular peak, SU number two. Now SU number one and SU number two have absolutely no rights to that spectrum. And in fact, the scenario may come up where let's say another licensed transmission starts transmitting in their spectrum. They have the, the secondary user has some limited amount of time. In some standards, 
20 milliseconds to get out of the way of the new primary user that's coming online. And so that is the biggest, one of the biggest challenges in dynamic spectrum access is sort of the time varying nature of the license spectrum and being able not to interfere with those primary users. Similar to DSA and spectrum sensing, there is another issue regarding the access of spectrum and that's in wireless interoperability. So it'd be great if we lived in a world where we only had one wireless standard that everybody could understand and, and talk with each other. Sort of like the Tower of Babel, right? The idea was all the people on the planet of Earth uh, would be able to communicate with each other in one tongue. But uh, as we know, um, uh, that tower got smashed and, and those peoples got spread throughout the Earth and they all speak in different tongues and can't communicate with each other. And, you know, that, that's a great story from, from the Bible and all. But this also happens in the real world too and sometimes in life or death scenarios. For instance, in Hurricane Katrina or Hurricane Sandy more recently, um, as we saw, uh, different organizations, law enforcement, in, even within the same organization, police, Coast Guard, firefighters, EMS, um, National Guard, um, Army, Navy, um, there, there are a multitude of different wireless standards and not all of them necessarily uh, uh, translate into one another. So as a result, what happens is uh, where there's a lack of communications, there's chaos, and, and in those situations, um, uh, those emergency rescue forces that are deployed in a, in a region in order to help save lives and stuff are not working as efficiently as they could. And, and, and being able to access spectrum, being able to identify who's who's out there and be able to sort of say, oh, you're using that standard, I'll work with you on that standard as well. Um, the interoperability is really key for uh, efficiently deployed operations and especially in sort of like emergency scenarios such as natural disasters or or similar so uh, I'll, I'll, I'll I'll show I'll, I'll draw a little example of what I mean by interoperability so suppose we have an operation in a city somewhere and we have police police and that's my, my attempt at drawing a police car um, suppose we have firefighters right and then, and that looks a little bit better and then of course the ladder right and the lights of course um, suppose we also have the military like National Guard or something like that so Right, In like World War Two era, <laughs> and um, suppose we have all, uh, and then and then perhaps also National Guard or something. So um, draw the Humvee. So so what happens is we have all these guys deployed, right? In in in. Um, in the field and what happens is let's say there's a nat natural disaster so let's say there's a fire or something uh, bad oh look like you know something something bad's happening right hurricane or and there's absolutely no centralized centralized um, telecommunications infrastructure operational infrastructure available so what do you do and um, what happens is spectrally these guys might be using different wireless standards let's say the police are using these bands police uh, let's say the National Guard are using that um, the firefighters might be using something here uh, fire department um, let's say um, uh, other other forces are using signals here, and so if you notice, they're they're using different frequency bins. They're using different wireless standards, and so there's no sort of interoperability going on. So what happens is, suppose 
there's a fire, but the police officer or a police uh, department is the one that found it. They, they're not equipped with putting out fires. So they have no way of, let's say, finding a fire and then saying, oh, I better communicate that directly to uh, the fire brigade or whatnot. They, they would have to call into headquarters and then headquarters would then need to relay that ultimately to the firefighters if, if, if possible. And, and, and so that's really the issue with interoperability is that you have all these standards, um, lots of folks from different organizations all deployed in a, in a specific region with potentially no centralized control how do they how do they inter, how do they work together in order to 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 use let's say scarce resources in order to save lives and such so that is a one of those challenges in the wireless communications world um, spectrum's one part of it wireless standards another um, creating equipment that can facilitate that software defined radio is well 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 built for something like that uh, all of these are um, issues that need to be taken into consideration when when focusing on interoperability okay so now that we saw how Spectrum works um, and um, this idea that it's a natural resource and we have Spectrum sensing techniques and, um, and the interoperability because we have multiple wireless um, uh, standards out there and, and they may not be all compatible with one another, let's jump in to um, one very practical aspect of Spectrum sensing, which is we've got to understand how we look at the electromagnetic spectrum around us. Most people think, oh, spectrum sensing, no problem. And just takes a snapshot instantly, just like a camera, and ta-da, that's what you have out there. And it's not quite that simple because, in fact, the way the spectrum sensor works is it takes a collection of time domain samples, then applies the fast Fourier transform to get the frequency representation. And the more accurate uh, a frequency rep representation you want of that spectrum, more time domain samples you're going to need to take. And, and what happens is uh, if you don't have a, um, an analog to digital converter that operates fast enough, those time domain samples come in very slowly. So, so there are a lot of these uh, additional practical requirements in order to understand how quickly and how well we take those spectrum snapshots. So uh, several things to consider when measuring and performing spectrum sensing is things like the sweep time. How long does it take to, uh, to, to acquire enough spectrum measurements in order to get a, um, a decent amount of resolution for a, a fixed frequency range. There's also resolution bandwidth. Like uh, if we take only a few time domain samples and that gives us only a few frequency domain samples, you know, we might miss some very important details that might um, indicate uh, the presence of a signal or maybe the, its identity. And then finally, there's something that, that some, um, some equipments like spectrum analyzers do automatically, but you can program this also called sweep averaging, where uh, it, it, although you can identify some signals with a single sweep uh, of, uh, of, of time domain samples that can then, can then be extracted into frequency samples, what happens is there's so much noise present that you need to sort of um, average out the noise. So, what a lot of folks do and a lot of equipment does is they uh, essentially take uh, 10 to 25 or more sweeps of the spectrum and then average it out. And what happens is um, the noise um, gets averaged out and the anything that's deterministic that, that is sort of characteristic of a signal present in the spectrum actually gets emphasized. And that's great because uh, then you can identify the presence of signals in, in that spectrum. And so now the last uh, important bit of, of doing spectrum sensing is the decision-making process. And for that, we use hypothesis testing. And it's very simple. You, you have two hypotheses. H0 means you have nothing but noise. So when you sense, uh, when you measure uh, and you get the measurements YK, all it's equal to is WK, which is just a bunch of noise samples. On the other hand, hypothesis one or H1 is that there's a signal that's also embedded with that noise and th that means the, sig uh, the spectrum is occupied. And so we can use techniques from signal estimation detection theory uh, in conjunction with this framework in order to implement um, decision making for spectrum sensors. Is that spectrum occupied or is it not? And if it's not, if it is occupied, we move on to another spectrum that is not occupied. And so this is really critical if we want to do sort of some sort of automatic decision-making process for opportunistically taking advantage of spectrum. 